Welcome, everybody. Uh, I know several are still joining uh, the webinar, um, but we do have uh, 102 people so far. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining the A School faculty lecture series. And today we have um, a professor that needs no introduction, um, Richard Guy Wilson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the School of Architecture, since we have been remote learning and um, so many of us have been home, have been having these lectures every Wednesday and they've been um, very successful. So Richard has been the first of our uh, extended series um, and we will now have, I believe, six more talks um, through mid-July with um, every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So thank you all for joining and we hope to see you in future lectures. Um, and so with that, I will turn this over to Richard Guy Wilson and, uh, and his talk on the design of the academical village evolution over time. So Richard, thank you so much for having us and thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you very much and thank you all for joining. I wish I could see you out there and wave and ask a question and get an answer back, but I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, but anyway, I am very honored to be here and to give a little bit of a chat about uh, the Academical Village. Uh, so anyway, uh, as you know, the University of Virginia is known for many things. Um, we have wonderful faculty, uh, of course the students, uh, the library, uh, and the alumni, but also, and one of the things that is, of course, really does, I think, set us apart, though all universities or colleges do have distinctive architecture, uh, is the architecture here of the, uh, is architecture here of the university. Uh, and what I'm going to treat today, um, in not a lengthy thing, I mean, I could go on for about uh, three days uh, talking about all of this, but talk a little bit about Jefferson's design of the Academical Village and then what happened to it in the, 19, in the 19th century. But one of the themes that seems to me is so important in understanding it and will run throughout uh, my talk is that Jefferson saw architecture uh, as having many things, of course. Uh, it's shelter, uh, but also he saw it as something that should inspire and in particular, with in relation to uh, the University of Virginia, that it should be having a teaching element, uh, that you should learn from architecture, that it isn't just something that looks good, uh, that shelters you, uh, but know that it is something that you really should uh, be able to, uh, that should, uh, should teach something. And I'll just do a couple of really quick quotes here on this. Uh, but this is a letter that Jefferson wrote to James Madison uh, back in 1785 when he was over in Paris. And he says, and I quote, but how is a taste in the beautiful art to be formed in our countrymen unless we avail ourselves of every occasion when public buildings are to be erected, presenting to them models for their study and imitation? You see, I am an enthusiast in the subject of arts, but it is not an enthusiasm of which I am ashamed. And that's very interesting. He's not ashamed of it. And of course, that brings up the whole issue of, to some degree, the way that arts are sometimes viewed and are they appropriate and so forth. But I think that it is something that is very, very, uh, that is very, very important. Another quote that uh, comes from uh, approximately the same time, uh, and this is a series of letters that he wrote about, if you're going to be an American coming abroad, what is it that you ought to look at? And he said and wrote, architecture is among the most important arts and it's desirable to introduce into an art which shows so much. And then he goes on and says, painting and sculpture, yes, fine, but architecture is really, architecture is really the key thing. So just a little bit of a background on Mr. Jefferson, as we all know, we have two views of him here. Uh, the one on the left is the earliest known portrait if you notice the date is 1786, uh, this is what, 10 years after the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's already been governor, but still we'd had nothing that 
knew what he looked like. And this was painted in London when he was over in London in 1786 by an American who was studying over there for uh, studying there. Uh, and what is interesting, of course, is he's very much of a dandy. He's got on a wig. He's got on a big, well, an overdone uh, bow tie. Uh, he's holding a Declaration of Independence in his hand there, down below. Uh, and then there is this twirling sculpture in the background. On the right is one of the very last views done of Jefferson by Thomas Sully, uh, who had come down to Charlottesville or to Albemarle County uh, to paint Jefferson's head uh, to, for a series of paintings that would go into the United States Capitol. But he was so overwhelmed by what he saw going on here in Charlottesville that he went back up north and painted this large painting that's about eight feet tall. It hangs today at West Point, the Military Academy at West Point. And if you didn't know, Jefferson is the person that founded that. Uh, but what is interesting about it is, of course, that he does holding something in his hand. We can assume it's Declaration of Independence, but that big column on the side. And I think that indicates that Sully was so impressed by what he saw going on here at the university. Now, very, very quickly, uh, just a little bit of Jefferson's architectural background since it's important. Uh, on the left, uh, the photograph is taken practically on the site of where his father, Peter Jefferson's house stood. And I am looking off on that little hill you see off in the distance there, that's where Monticello. Uh, so this is where he was born and that is where he built the house. And of course, that is where he died. And it is up there that he began building Monticello. And this is the design of the first Monticello uh, that uh, we all know here uh, that was under construction, as you can see, for about 14 years. Uh, Jefferson uh, was a person that loved, um, uh, uh, that loved to do things. Uh, and this is a quote here from a lady friend much later in life. Uh, but remembers Jefferson saying this when he was up in Washington, D.C. And I quote, architecture is my delight and putting up and pulling down one of my favorite amusements. Uh, and what she is, of course, talking about is that um, Monticello, there is a, some of you may have had a hand uh, in the construction of this wooden model, but Monticello one might have looked like if it had ever been finished. And then, of course, uh, the Monticello that we all know today, uh, which is, has at the base of it, uh, the building that you see on the left, but then much, much enlarged and changed, and of course, with the, and changed, and of course, with the Great Dome. Now, what this is a, a, of a background is that Jefferson was very involved in architecture. Okay, how did he learn architecture? And keep in mind that there were no architecture schools in this country. Uh, the very first one is MIT, 1867. Uh, we don't establish one here at the University of Virginia. We're the 10th oldest architecture school. We were established in 1919. So how did he learn architecture? He learned it through books. I'm showing you the book that he loved the most. Uh, he had a number of different editions of Palladio, but he had over 35 architectural books in his library. And keep in mind that these are books that were very expensive at that point in time. You just didn't run down to Barnes and Noble and pick it up. Most of these were being shipped from abroad and went into, and went into this library. So he learned about architecture through the books. The second way that he learned about architecture, and this is very important and should be kept in mind, that the architect and construction, the architect and builder, were really one and the same thing back in those days. Now today, it's a very separate sort of activity, but back then the architect was very much involved in the actual construction and Jefferson knew all of this sort of stuff. I'm just showing you a brick maker that is on the right and then some of the different sorts of tools and he knew an awful lot of this sort of stuff and knew exactly how these things would be done. The third way, uh, that he learned architecture was through travel. Travel both here in the United States, and of course he's up and down the East Coast a number of different times. He was not very enamored of the architecture that he saw that was going up here. And then of course he traveled abroad, as I already mentioned, and lived for approximately five years in Paris, though traveling rather extensively in Europe. And one of the results of this was his design for the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond which I would argue is his most important building, not his greatest, that's here at the University of Virginia, 
But this is the first public building built after the revolution. And of course, what he sets as a model for it is a building that he'd seen down in the south of France, the Maison Carré in Nimes. He had been there. He reports that he sat all day just looking at it and that the locals there began to think that they had a nutcase in their hand, that they just were, they were sitting there looking at the building. But this is where we begin to get the official governmental architecture, which will, ex which will exist for many, many, many years. Now, I also should note that Jefferson, of course, was also very much involved in a lot of other things, very much involved in Washington, D.C. He did a plan for Washington, D.C. That is not the way that the final L'Enfant plan was carried out. Though it's interesting, if you look carefully there, you can see that he is seeing a long sort of a promenade with the one end the president's house, the other end of the Capitol. Uh, L'Enfant will take this and blow it up. And there is also in the Jefferson drawings, this wonderful drawing right here of a circular structure. And if you look carefully, you can see at the top of it, H of representatives on the right, Senate, on the bottom, courts of justice, in the center, passage and stairs. Now keep this plan in mind because it's gonna look like something that comes up later on. But this is apparently his proposal for the United States Capitol. It was not built, uh, but it is very, but it's very influential. And then just finally to summarize this here very, very quickly, uh, Jefferson, uh, of course, is involved in a lot of other buildings around. All you had to do really was say, hey, Mr. Jefferson, I'd like a house, and he would come up with some designs for you. So he designed building for himself, such as down the lower left-hand corner, Poplar Forest's getaway. Uh, but he also designed several courthouses, such as the one up in the right, and then houses around, the, the, such as Farmington, uh, and down in the uh, uh, farming up in the upper left at uh, Edgemont. The point of all of this is that Jefferson is sometimes said to be a gentleman architect or an amateur architect, but I think that that's really a little unfair. He is a person who really knew all about architecture and knew what was, uh, and knew what was going on. So now we turn to the University of Virginia and what went on here. Uh, and the University of Virginia is an idea uh, that is a long time in coming, because indeed as early as the 1779, Jefferson proposes that the state ought to take on the education of the populace and that he sets up a system of a, what we would call today a primary school system, a secondary, and then a collegiate level. Now this did not happen, but this is, he is, has this idea very much in his background. Now, Jefferson attended the College of William and Mary down in Williamsburg uh, in the 1760s. Uh, and of course, it has been reconstructed as part of the colonial Williamsburg uh, scheme over the years. The college is still there. And of course, it's a very great, great school. But this is basically the way that he knew the building, uh, uh, knew the school at the time with the big Wren building in the center. And then off to the left was the school for the Native Americans. And off to the right was the president's house but all of the 40 odd young white males and six of their seven faculty all lived in that one big building. This is where they took their classes. This is where they ate their food. This is where they slept. And descriptions of life there are like, well, uh, rugby road on a Friday or Saturday night when school is in session. Uh, in other words, it was a land based of a lot of different sorts of uh, drunken activities. And Jefferson, even later on in his life, admits that he took, uh, took part in this. And so keep this in mind because this is what he is reacting against. This is not what he's going to have at the University of Virginia, is shoving everybody into one, uh, shoving everybody into one large building. Now, as I say, the idea had been percolating around for many, many years, but finally in 1814. He has been out of the presidency for a couple of years. Uh, he got out of the presidency uh, in 1812 uh, and is back here, uh, is back here uh, in Virginia, uh, uh, in, in Charlottesville. And a group of young men, including one of them was a nephew of his, had come up with an idea that they ought to have a local school calling, the, calling it the Albemarle Academy. And in July, 
1814, they were having a meeting downtown Charlottesville along what is today what we would call Market Street in the Old Stone Tavern. It is no longer there, but there's a big hysterical marker up in front of it uh, where it stood. They were having a meeting uh, about this academy, and all of a sudden somebody looked up and said, oh my goodness, they knocked on the window and in comes Jefferson. He had been riding by. You often wonder, maybe this is all set up. But anyway, he came inside and he took the entire thing over. And in the next month or so, month and a half, he came up with a scheme for this Albemarle Academy. And this is two sides of the same sheet of paper. Notice down in the corner, the way it is cut away. And then if we turn it over, you can see on the left, there is, uh, it's cut away. Now, what he comes up with is a scheme for this Albemarle Academy. And this is the genesis for the University of Virginia, the plan. And it's a big U-shaped scheme with nine pavilions, as you can see scattered around, three at the top, three on each side, in between rooms for the students, behind gardens, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's a gigantic thing. And in the center, it's written 257 yards. So that is two and a half Scott Stadium's length. Uh, a gigantic thing, which it might have been okay if you were down in the Tidewater or if you're out in Iowa to lay it out, but not really so hot here for, uh, not here for the Piedmont. On the other side, which I showed you just a minute ago, it does these schemes for what would be the professor's house or the teacher's house. And you can see on the ground on the lower level uh, that you have this covered walkway. Then you have this big building with a teaching room in the center, staircases coming in, two potties on either side, and then off to the sides of this, the rooms for the students, and then you have the front elevation with the second floor, this above, and this is where the teacher or the professor would live. So this is the beginning now of the whole idea of the university uh, is, uh, is, is coming to fruition. Uh, what happens in the next couple of years is that this Albemarle Academy idea catches on and through some political shenanigans of both Jefferson and some of his cronies that are on this committee, this Alamo Academy committee, they get some money through, they send a bill, excuse me, through the state legislature and get some money and they begin to purchase lands which become what is today the University of Virginia. Uh, and if you look at this scheme here, uh, that I have up on the screen and look over on the right hand side, you can see sort of roughly laid out a sort of the plan, the beginning of the plan of the university. That's the corners right there uh, coming by. And then he projects out other lands that maybe the Central College ought to do. So anyway, the state sets up Central College and they purchase some land here and the idea that they're gonna begin to build. And then it is in 19 and 1819 that the name changes to the uh, name changes to the Uni University of Virginia. So anyway, he's got some land. Uh, they've got some money to start to do something. And so what do you do next? Well, he writes a letter to William Thornton. And William Thornton was the first architect of the United States Capitol and had been a buddy of Jefferson's up in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Thornton is the guy that won the competition for the United States Capitol. Uh, and Jefferson writes a letter, it's on the left, Dear Sir, and up at the top, Monticello, and then there's a dot and it says May 9.17. And then you can see there is a sort of a sketch in the center, a rough sketch in the center. Down in the left-hand corner, says Dr. Thornton. And he says in here, I'm writing to you to ask for your suggestions for the fronts of the pavilions no two alike. They should be specimens for the architectural lectures. Well, what happens is that Thornton misunderstands this, at least as far as we can figure out. And what he sends back is he sends back this drawing here on the right. And it's a beautiful, as you can see, it's a beautiful uh, ink and pen, uh, 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 ink and pen drawing. Uh, and it has on the top a building with a pediment and then you have a colonnade, and then below you have an arcade, and then the second building, this is the, the other eight. So this would be the central building, and you're still talking about three buildings across the top, and then three buildings down the side, and then these would be the others. So anyway, this is the first thing, and so 
They laid the cornerstone for the university in October 1817 on this building right here, Pavilion Number no. 7, which today you, some of you will know is the Colonnade Club. And it's based pretty much on Thornton's scheme. Not quite. Thornton on that upper colonnade had Corinthian capitals. And here they are Greek, I mean, excuse me, Roman Doric. But other than that, it's a pretty much a similar sort of a similar sort of scheme. And this is where the first building begins here, begins at the university. So they begin with this. But Jefferson, still not quite satisfied with what's going on. So he writes, he wrote another letter right after he got back Thornton's letter to Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And Benjamin Henry Latrobe was the second architect of the United States Capitol. He took over from Thornton and he did a lot of others, a very, very important American architect, uh, born in England, though of American parents, and they come back uh, and did a lot of very, very important buildings. And Jefferson writes Latrobe a letter, uh, exactly the same letter that he had written to, uh, 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 written to Thornton. And Latrobe writes back a letter here and he says, well, look at put in the middle a domed building. Uh, there's still this wide sort of a scheme. So what is interesting here is that Jefferson, and I think this is one of the most important, another one of the most important things that architects or students should learn, is that you should always be looking for some advice. You ought to be getting other people and so forth to be giving you, uh, giving you advice and things. Anyway, what ultimately does happen is that they have the site, and of course it's a hilly, as you know, a sort of a thing. Uh, Jefferson squeezes the thing together to 180 to 188 feet from one side to the other side across the lawn and puts at the top of it a round building. And then, and there are now 10 pavilions that stretch down the lawn. And what happens on these number of pavilions is that the Board of Visitors, um, uh, had suggested, well, maybe we ought to have 10 disciplines, and so we ought to have a building for each of the different disciplines, and so it's expanded into the 10, dis uh, expanded into the 10 disciplines. What is interesting in the Jefferson drawings that we have, uh, such as you can see, you can see here, uh, and I hope you can make this out, uh, that he is playing around, and at this point here, he's only got four pavilions down each side, plus the big round building at the top, the rotunda, and then he's trying to figure out what to do behind the pavilions. And so he has on the bottom, as you can see, he's got these ranges for more student rooms pushed up against him within the garden stretching out. But then he cuts that out, clip, clip, clip. And then he draws in another piece of paper and slides in the way that we know it today with the gardens and then the outer, uh, and then the outer ranges. Uh, the point of all of this is that this evolution of this design here uh, goes on for many years uh, and there's lots of different ideas and so forth. Now on the rotunda here at the university, it is based, as you can see, on the Pantheon in Rome. Uh, and this is an illustration from, uh, uh, from Palladio. Uh, and this is his drawing of the rotunda. Uh, sometime in late 1818 to March 1819, not quite sure what. It's not, of course, the exact duplicate of it. But one of the most important things is, of course, and if you look carefully in Jefferson's drawing, you can see a sort of dot, 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 dot down to bottom. This is a perfect sphere. And back in those times, the idea of the circle, the sphere, the most perfect sorts of geometrical forms was really a central issue uh, for architects. And so that was, uh, so that is what he is, uh, uh, that's what he is creating here. Uh, and once again, to go back and here we have the uh, uh, section of it. And then I'm putting back in uh, this United States capital scheme. And this brings back around to what I showed you a minute ago when Latrobe suggests to Jefferson putting this domed structure in the center. And of course, the dome structure was perfect in cylindrical form. But he also knew that Jefferson had a dome bug of the worst order, or that Jefferson was really consumed by domed buildings and so forth. And so he's sort of giving back to Jefferson his own idea that Jefferson had tried out or tried to suggest up there in Washington, D.C. 
Now, the plan of the rotunda, uh, as you can see once again here in the section that he has this sphere in there, and you have on the ground floors where the chemistry labs are going to be upstairs uh, on the middle floor uh, are going to be some lecture rooms, and then the library is to be located up there at the top. And of course, this is very, very symbolic. This is the first American university or college that the library is the center. In other words, the book is the center. Instead of having a chapel as the center, you have the library and the book at the very, at the, uh, at the very center. Uh, just sort of a footnote for the construction of uh, the rotunda. The dome was held up by a laminated wood truss system that had been developed by Philbert Delorme, who was a French. He published a book in 1576. Jefferson had a copy of it uh, in his library, uh, though he had sold it uh, to the Library of Congress, but he borrowed the book back to get this uh, to build, uh, for this. Uh, and this is where the thing, uh, where the dome was, because of course we always think of domes such as the Pantheon in Rome, uh, uh, that they're masonry. Well, there's no way that they construct a masonry dome here, out here in the hinterlands of uh, in the hinterlands of, of Virginia. Um, the interior, there's only, I think, about three known photographs of the interior of the rotunda prior to the fire of 1895, which I'll be coming back to in a minute. Uh, but here is one right here. And as you can see, the university wasn't much different then than it is now. It was sort of a mess in there. Uh, but this is the way that it looked uh, prior to the fire. And then this is a photograph of just a couple of years ago uh, after the restoration by Frederick Nichols uh, and uh, bringing, it back, uh, bringing it back to the, uh, the, the original look. Uh, but once again, to come back to this idea of uh, the rotunda at the center of the university, uh, that if you go and look at any of the other American universities around, what you're going to see is you're going to see these sort of much more religious type of structures are the center of it and not a not, and not the library and this is really the very first of the uh, very first building uh, for that for the pavilions on the lawn these were to be teaching tools no two alike as specimens for the architectural lectures now he hasn't been he have an architecture school uh, but that there would be a faculty out there that would be telling the students well look at this look at pavilion number two what sort of an order do you have there? Do you have an ionic order? Where did it come from? It came from the Temple Fortuna Virilis, which still stands in Rome today, uh, there in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the forum. Uh, but it had been drawn up by Palladio and put in his book, and that's what Jefferson is picking up for the facade of, of, pavilion, of pavilion number two. Uh, and if you look up at the very top, as you can see, uh, what he has up there, uh, he even writes down, he says, Ionic of Fortuna, uh, Fortuna Fearless. Uh, Jefferson produced these drawings, um, and uh, as you can see, what you have is you have the ground floor plan that's below uh, the elevation, and then you have a basement floor plan that's to the right. This is where the cooking would take place, and then upstairs, on upstairs, you would have the professors, uh, you have the professors' quarters, and so forth. And the students would be entering in through the front door there, and there would be a couple of different rooms that would be used for teaching and so forth. And as they say, downstairs, uh, downstairs cooking, uh, ups, uh, upstairs living. Uh, here it is. And then on the back of all of these drawings, with the exception of one of them, he works out his specifications. Uh, and th these are rather interesting to look at because he's working on some of these these dimensions and so forth down to about one one hundredth of an inch. And you can just imagine what the builders, the carpenters thought about that if they were shown this sort of a thing. Uh, in other words, this is a fellow that is really obsessed with, uh, really obsessed with this. So we have the Ionic Pavilion 2 and across from it, Pavilion number one. And let me just mention here, the numbering on these pavilions did change. At one point, it was all one, two, three, four, five uh, down uh, the uh, west side, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten down, uh, uh, down the east side, and then they were switched uh, switch back. Uh, but here is, of course, this is the Doric of the Diocletian's baths. He draws it up. Damn, I forgot the chimney. And so if you look at the drawing, he is 
pasted on the back a little scrap of paper and put the chimney up there, on, uh, put the chimney up there, uh, uh, up there on it. Uh, and here, uh, this is, I say, the works of Diocletian's baths in Rome uh, that have been shown in the book by a French authors, uh, Chambray and Edouard, a parallel of architecture, antique and modern, which he also owned the copy of. Uh, and what is interesting is several things. It is always Palladio across from Chambray. It isn't all Palladio one side, all Chambray the other side. There is an intermixture that goes back and forth. And some of us have spent a lot of time trying to figure this out, and I still don't have any answer to this. Uh, we don't have any answer to the exact why this is Doric and you have Ionic, uh, because it does change around who is the occupants of the pavilions and so forth. But the point is that this is a teaching, this is a learning tool. Now, as you also can see, of course, that while they're copying uh, the sort of the sunburst uh, type of figure up there uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, up there along in the, in the entablature, uh, still uh, you do not have the reeded type of a column that you had because all of the columns on the lawn are brick and then covered over with a skin coat of plaster and then over the years they've been painted a num painted number of different colors. Uh, as you go down the lawn, and I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to do every, uh, every one of the pavilions, uh, but it's very interesting. Here we have the Corinthian order uh, which is pavilion number eight. And again, this comes from Chambray uh, and Edouard. Uh, and uh, some of these more complicated orders or capitals, I should say, were actually carved in, uh, in Italy uh, and then shipped over. Jefferson uh, worked this out and they were all carved in a, in a quarry in Italy uh, and shipped over. Uh, and when they came into customs in New York, that's where ships normally entered in those years, uh, they tried to charge some uh, duty on this. And Jefferson wrote a letter and said, no, it's part of the educational tool. And he was able to get them through customs without paying, without paying, any, uh, without paying any duties. Uh, but this, again, is an indication of the teaching element uh, and, of course, the obsession with this. Uh, here we are at the end of the lawn, uh, and we're looking at uh, pavilion number 10 on the left, uh, which is the Doric, uh, the Theater of Marseilles. Uh, and on the right, we have the Ionic, the Temple Virilis, uh, coming from Palladio. But they're very, very different. Uh, and that's one of the things, I think, one of the most extraordinary things about uh, the lawn and one of the most extraordinary things about Jefferson's architecture, because after all, what were the rules of classical architecture at that time? Repeat, repeat, repeat. You have the same damn thing. And Jefferson, no, he's willing to break the rules and to put in these different sorts of facades so that you have this wonderful ensemble of really sort of a history of architecture that stretches, uh, stretches up and down the lawn. Uh, now, if you look at, you can see here, and, uh, well, excuse me, I'll come back. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, just to put in a note of who does a lot of the work. Uh, Jefferson is the major supervisor on all of this stuff. But then there are a whole variety of other individuals and we've come up with now, I think there is in the neighborhood of 400 uh, different names. And then in addition to that, there are a whole bunch of people that we don't have any names for that were enslaved and so forth uh, who worked on this. But this is a sort of a list right here of some of the people whose names have been able to dig out of the records and so uh, records and so forth over the year. And the project here went on for practically 10 years. Uh, it was pretty much done when Jefferson passed away on July 4th, 1826. Uh, but it had, was one of the largest construction projects that was going on in the United States at the time. I should note, only other, th only other things that would be of equivalent would be building of the Erie Canal across upper state New York and also the reconstruction of Washington DC after the Brits burned it in the war of 1812. Uh, but it was a huge, huge, huge sort of a project. Uh, but here, this is what I was mentioning earlier uh, on Pavilion 10. Some of you may know Pavilion 10, the way it looks on the left when it's painted white. Uh, and as you can see up at the top, 
Uh, we have replaced, uh, or I should say that the facilities uh, and the university architect replaced a number of years ago, an original attic story that was up there that Jefferson Grouchy designed, uh, which fell off in the 1890s. And of course, that's been one of the real problems of the university over the years is the maintenance of all of this. And also the colors have changed. The colors have changed very, very considerably. Uh, and I'm just showing you right here. These are the columns that are in front of the student rooms. And they're the Tuscan order. The Tuscan order is the lowest of the classical orders. And then you've got the Doric, then you have the Ionic, then you have the Corinthian, and then you have the composite. You have the five orders. The Tuscan order, the lowest order, where is it? In front of where the students are. And then you get the other three orders, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, in front of the pavilions. The composite only appears one place at the university, inside the rotunda, up in the dome room, the library. And so again, there is a hierarchy that he is trying to teach here of this. Uh, on these columns right here, these were some that were finished a couple of years ago where they scraped off about 120 different coats of white paint uh, and restored them back. And this is the original color that Jefferson really wanted. I was a tan and not all of this white because he wanted to like, make it look like stone. Uh, what you do have, of course, and I've emphasized this a couple of different times, but just to go on, is that you have here an architectural museum, a teaching tool. That this is the way that you would learn about, learn about architecture. And it depends on where you go. And you have the different spatial sensations. I should note that the term space, the way you, we use it today, isn't really invented into the 20th century. But you have this different of the arcades and so forth out in the ranges and the views down these are so different than the views that we had right here. And I think that this is something that is very much in Jefferson and very, very much in Jefferson's mind. Just a couple of words about the gardens behind the pavilions. Uh, the walls have all been rebuilt. The Garden Club of Virginia paid for this a number of years ago for rebuilding. They all fell down, but they're of course in this curvilinear type of pattern and are originally much taller. And this is where the professor and or the hotel keeper, because the meals are being served out of the hotels out in the ranges, this is where the sort of the kitchen garden would be. Not the main garden, they were off up in the, uh, off, uh, off uh, uh, outside of the main university. And these of course now have been changed into these wonderful sort of spaces uh, that have the, the, with, this, uh, with these uh, uh, wonderful designs. Well, this is sort of the way that the university looked about 1826 uh, when he passed away. Uh, this view right here does show just about the time that this is being done the trees are begin to be planted up the lawn. They are not there yet, but he always intended that there be a series of trees that would be stretching up the lawn as well in, fr uh, as well, uh, in front of the pavilions. Uh, but there are other changes that took place. And of course, what inevitably happens is that the method of teaching changes, changes dramatically over the years. And so that there are different things that are needed. For instance, this view right here, this is from the late 1850s after this huge annex had been put onto the rotunda, designed by Robert Mills, a very, very important American architect. Uh, but the type of classes that were being held, what people needed to learn, how you would be taught was very, very different. And so these are big lecture spaces and so forth that were put into, uh, put into the annex. Uh, other changes that occurred in these years, uh, and I just put this in, this is a building that you all walked by, did you ever pay much attention to it? But this, this is Brooks today, Brooks Hall, but it was originally put up. It was a gift right after the war between the states uh, by a northerner who wanted to bring some education down to some of the southern schools. And he gave a huge collection of natural history specimens to be shown off. The university said, thank you very much, but we don't have any place to put it. Oh, well, here's some plans and here's $10,000. And so the Brooks Hall, Brooks Hall was built. This is one of the drawings that we have over in special collections. Um, and as you can see, this is a rather different sort of thing. But it does, I think, continue on uh, with the idea. Um, around the building, if you ever look very closely, you can see there is a head of one of the faculty members right there. No, I'm not kidding, uh, but there is that. Originally on the inside, there was this huge mastodon, which in the early 20th century was picked up and 
taken off to a pit somewhere outside of town and disappeared. I've often wondered that in a couple of centuries, somebody's going to be digging around and they'll come across as mastodons and say, my goodness, they had mastodons who were running around in the early 20th century in Charlottesville. But anyway, uh, and now, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, the anthropology group. Uh, one of the problems that plagued the university right from the beginning when it opened was that there wasn't a chapel. And there were a number of different proposals put forward over the years that there ought to be chapels. One that would be stuck right in the middle of the lawn. We don't have any drawings for that. In 1859, uh, William Pratt comes up with this scheme, which would be put at the end of the lawn between pavilions 9 and 10. And you can see is the Gothic sort of a mode. The problem was is that there's a bunch of heathens being trained up here in Charlottesville, that this was not typical of other American universities that always had chapels at the center that we needed something. And so campaigns were mounted. The war, of course, prevented this being built. But finally, we did get the chapel, which is built off to the side, designed by Charles Cassell, money that was given by Virginia women for training, uh, for training the heathens up here. And it is a wonderful building and provides a wonderful contrast of the classicism of the lawn within the medievalism, the Gothic, and so forth, the Gothic, so forth, the chapel. Well, Sunday morning, October 27th, 1895, a fire broke out in the rotunda. It was actually started in the annex, spread over in the rotunda. The students rushed in, grabbed books. They got about 7,000 books that they pulled out. They pulled out the statue of Jefferson, but the building was gone. The New York firm of McKim, Mead, and White, the preeminent American architectural firm at the time, angled for the job, and they finally got it. And they came up with a new scheme in which they took out that middle floor and turned the entire building, or the two floors, into a, uh, into a library. Because, of course, the number of books had just grown tremendously than the 8,500 that Jefferson really specified. And they also, as you can see here on this, uh, they said that they sh you should put on a uh, 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 you should put on a new entrance, and that had always been a slightly a problem for the university was how you were to get onto the lawn. Jefferson intended you to come in from the south end and proceed up towards the university, but of course the main east-west road was north of it, and so that never worked very well. So this is the new entrance that they put on on the north side of the rotunda, and this is the way that the interior look after it was completed and was our library up until uh, 1937 when Alderman Library was built and the books were, uh, and the book, books were moved out. Um, at the same time that they were doing that, uh, the firm was asked by the faculty, we need some more buildings. Again, you have to have something new. And so Jefferson, uh, so excuse me, Stanford White, he said, no, I don't think I ought to put it there. They said, put the building there. And so he put Old Cavill and Rouse and Cock Hall at the south end of the lawn. This is a very, very rough sketch, as you can see, that he's doing on the University of Virginia stationery when he was down here uh, on one of the visits to supervise the construction of, of, the, of the rotunda. And so what we do get, uh, and this is sort of the tail end of, of my tale, is that the south end of the lawn, Jefferson's original view is blocked off by these three buildings. Today, what we know is Old Cavill Hall, and then Rouse and Cock Hall on either side. What was interesting about this is, is that Sanford White, he was the partner in charge, so McKim had his finger in the scheme very much, was that they were continuing on Jefferson's idea that this is a very much a teaching tool, and so that you have some shifts in orders and so forth, but still at the same time. And then you come inside to the big, uh, uh, to the big auditorium, and there you have, if you sit down, like we are here and looking down towards what is going on, a discussion. We look up at the mural. What do you have? You have Raphael's School of Athens, a copy of that, which hangs in the Vatican and Rome. And proceeding down the lawn towards you from the rotunda is in the center you have, uh, you have uh, Plato uh, and Socrates. And they are proceeding down towards you with all the other great thinkers of antiquity spread around. So the idea of education continues. And then just to note that out in, if you have not been back in a number of years, 
uh, that in the uh, in the lobby, a new set of murals was put in a few years ago by Lincoln Perry uh, that continues on the whole idea uh, of that art uh, should be a teaching tool, that that should be part of the education of the students. So in any event, that's a sort of the end of my tale uh, right here. Uh, I could go on, of course, for a long, long time. Uh, but it is rather interesting that Jefferson's tombstone, he specified what is to be put on it up at Monticello, though this is not the original. The original one is out in Missouri because they got chipped away so many times, this replacement. But he specified the words that are on there, and it is, here lies Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. Nothing of being president, governor, you name it, uh, but two intellectual, really three intellectual things. So anyway, that's the end of my talk, and um, I'm welcome to have any um, uh, uh, have have uh, have any have any uh, any discussion. Well, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, not a big deal. <laughs> um, so we have a question um, from Cordelia it says, uh, "What did the other side of the rotunda look like before McKee, Mead, and White changed?" Well, before, excuse me, before Robert Mills put on his addition there, uh, it was basically a plain brick thing, and we don't have any views of what the thing looked like. Jefferson did not do an end elevation of it, so we don't know what it looked like, but it was apparently, it was very, very plain. There was some sort of a little door down at the bottom, but that was it. It was just a, a big blank, a big blank brick wall. And, uh... Don says, uh, was there no thought to keep the Stanford White Rotunda renovation? Was there no what? No thought. Did, there was no thought to keep it. Uh, there, were some people, there were some people who complained. Um, I, I arrived just as the work was going on. Uh, I have to admit I probably would have liked to have kept uh, the Stanford White um, thing because it was original. Uh, but what is interesting is that the, uh, the new thing has become much more of a useful type of a space. I mean, the restoration and so forth. Uh, but again, this gets into the whole, a lot of issues and so forth about, uh, about uh, um, what the heck, I'm sorry. Uh, this gets, a lot of, it gets into a lot of issues about um, restoration and what you should do and how much you keep of the original, how much do you change and so forth. And um, it's, it's a backwards and forwards sort of thing. But yes, there were a couple of complaints at the time, uh, but uh, very much the idea was, and Freddie Nichols, Fred Nichols, who directed it, uh, was really a very, very important, a very, very important uh, person uh, uh, in this. Uh, George says, has the recent preservation work brought new understanding of Jefferson's architecture on campus? Yes, I would say so. I'd say it very definitely has, um, and uh, uh, it is it very, very definitely brought that. Uh, for many, many years, and there have been real complaints among a number of the alums, why these gray tan colors? It should be white. That's the way I remember it. But the facts are, is that Jefferson really wanted those tan colors because he wanted to look like stone. Uh, he, wanted, he didn't want it to look like it was uh, imitation, uh, and the, but they began whitewashing things many, many years ago because the stucco around the different columns began to crack and crack, and so they decided to, uh, decided, decided to whitewash it. But we're taking that back. <clears throat> and uh, also, uh, the, the, uh, the roofs over the tops of the student rooms were originally very, very flat. Uh, they leaked, and so uh, peak grooves are put in. Those are beginning to be put back and so forth. So we have several questions uh, pertaining to the insistence, why the insistence of putting Cabell Hall where it is, you know, um, you know, has there ever been a discussion to, dis to demolish old Cabell Hall to extend the original open view of the lawn? No, I don't think there's ever any chance. The reason why Cabell Hall was put there, and there's nothing ever said about this, but over the road, JPA, 
was an area that was known as Canada, and it was an African-American area. And a lot of those people worked here at the university. And so to a certain degree, it was sort of blocking that off. Now today we own all of that land or we, the university owns all that land. But, and there's never anything's been said about this, but this is just simply a speculation on my part uh, that that's one of the reasons, reasons why it was done. The other thing was, as I said, that the entrance to the university that Jefferson intended coming up there just didn't work that well. And it was quite a steep slope coming up and all of that. And uh, so anyway, but no, I mean, today we have, uh, we have not only uh, 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 old Cabell Hall, as we call it, but we have new Cabell Hall that's behind it. And then behind that, of course, we have the new South Lawn. Uh, and it's a huge number of different buildings and so forth that are important. And then I would just go on and say that the auditorium in Old Cabell Hall is really a very great space. It's a wonderful musical space and uh, it would really be a loss if that was gone. We have a couple of questions um, about the range rooms and the genesis of them. Why were they in the plan? And they have such a very different feel because they don't look out into the lawn. So did Jefferson plan for these rooms to be for students? How did, how, how, I guess a little bit more about this. Well, the range rooms, uh, the thing was is that the original idea for the university or the Alabama Academy was about 80 to 90 students. And then when they finally came around to the full scale scheme of a uh, University of Virginia, they projected 400 students. So they needed some place to put 400 people. And so basically what you have is you have these rooms and each of the, each of the student rooms uh, would house two people. And so it was really an addition to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, no, you don't look out onto the lawn, but you do have, I think, a very different sort of a sensation there walking down the arcade and so forth. Um, and uh, originally, uh, the way it was, was that the younger students would live on the lawn and then the older students would live out there in the ranges, uh, but that changed, uh, that changed over the years. Um, we have a couple of questions um, from Christina Wilson and Laura Thorne that are about Please comment on the American universities built in the early mid 19th century that were most heavily influenced or inspired by Jefferson's UVA. University of Delaware comes to mind. Are there others? And a, a second part to that is just um, how the academic village did it serve in approving the architecture around the nation? Did, it, did the students go on to promote the lessons they learned from the lawn? Well, that's, that, that would be very difficult to say. I mean, of the influence of the University of Virginia, there was a hair as mentioned at that point in time, but it was really forgotten. Jefferson was totally out of the picture. And the University of Virginia, Charlottesville was sort of an album out of the way, sort of a place. It comes back into focus with the big fire in 1895. Uh, and uh, I sh should have noted that uh, Charles McKim had come down here in 1892. Uh, we're not quite sure why. And there's this wonderful letter. He says, I can't believe what I've seen at the University of Virginia. And that's one of the reasons why McKim, Mead, and White tried to get themselves in. But there had been no books done on Jefferson's architecture. Jefferson wasn't known as an architect. I mean, you know, and of course, you keep in mind, we're after, uh, we're after the Civil War. Uh, and he'd become a symbol for the Confederacy in, in many, many ways. Uh, and so he was really down, uh, was, was, was sort of down at the bottom. So the uh, McKim, Mead, and White work here really brought it back. And then after that, you begin to get universities that pick up on uh, the UVA type of scheme. And one of the ones that uh, comes to mind almost immediately is a, 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 a Duke, a Duke Women's Campus is almost a direct a copy, a direct copy of this. But there are a variety of others uh, that come along. But at the time, I mean, there was a little bit, uh, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't play out because of course, how you communicated ideas in those years and so forth, you didn't have photographs, that type of thing. It was a real, real problem. Uh, we have a question from Stephen that says, Richard, do you care to comment more about the influence of Thomas Jefferson's time in Paris, such as uh, Marley and Desert 
Day Red. Uh -huh. Sorry about my friend. <laughs> yes, well, um, I would argue that Jefferson's five years abroad, uh, the reason why he went abroad was that he was uh, sent over, he becomes what we today call the ambassador uh, to the court of Louis the, uh, 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 court of Louis the 16th. Uh, but he, uh, uh, they were also trying to negotiate a treaty uh, with Britain. This was after the war. But the other reason why he went abroad was that his wife Martha had just passed away uh, and he was devastated. That's the reason why he work stops at Monticello uh, and he goes abroad. But those five years are very, very important. Uh, and he does, he goes out to look at a bunch of the different uh, uh, Gardens, as just mentioned, uh, Desert de Reps. Uh, over in England, uh, he and Adams do a toot up through the English Midlands, uh, looking at different gardens and buildings. And one could go on about this. There's a whole bunch of different buildings that he sees that then will come back and influence uh, some of his later work. And in particular, Pavilion Number no. 9, that sort of recessed niche that is in there, uh, there are, uh, this is a thing that he saw in a garden in, in England. Uh, he also saw that in a house that was only about two blocks, it no longer stands, but about two blocks from where one of his quarters was in Paris. And so he's picking up on these, uh, he's, pick, he's picking up on these ideas and so forth. We have a couple of questions um, asking about the most recent renovations. Sorry, we have a couple of questions about the most recent renovations. Um, that were leading up to the bicentennial. So can you speak a little about the recent renovations, what have changed uh, within the last several years, and maybe even speak to um, the recent archaeological findings? During yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of things have happened. In the archaeological point of view, there's been a lot of work done uh, and uh, digging up stuff from the pavilions and so forth, but also a lot of information about the African Americans who worked here uh, over the years, the enslaved population and all of that, and where they lived, and uh, that they lived in uh, some rather humble quarters, uh, sometimes just little shacks that were out there in uh, the gardens behind uh, the professor's pavilions, uh, sometimes in the basements and so forth, and stuff has been dug up uh, that's very, very, uh, very, very important on that. Um, and then let's see, what was the other part of it? Oh, the recent renovations. Well, McKim Maiden White wanted the, especially the lawn face of the rotunda to be exactly the way that McKim and Maiden White had done it with the same capitals and so forth up there. The university, we've run out of money. Sorry, we can't do it. And so there was stuck up there some big blocks of cheap marble and the capitals were not carved. And it was not until about 10 years later that the capitals on the lawn side were finally carved and they weren't done a very good job and it was a cheap marble and it really wasn't a copy of the stuff that Jefferson had intended. And then, and don't quote me exactly on this, but about maybe 10, 12 years ago, one of the leaves of those capitals fell off and thank goodness it weighed 110 pounds, nobody was underneath it. But they began to recognize that they got a real problem here. So they did go back and out of the same quarry in Carrara in Italy, this is the big marble quarry, one of the big marble quarries in Italy where Jefferson had originally had his capitals carved, the new ones were carved, and brought over and put up. And so the capitals up there are very much now, much, much more like uh, what was intended. The other thing that is probably the bigger, if you haven't been back for a number of years, was upstairs uh, on the original library space in the rotunda. They had put up there an acoustical type of a paneling that was just the ugliest thing in the world. And a few years ago, this was all taken down and redone. And so it now it looks like a white type of an interior, the way that Jefferson did it. And then as a footnote to this, some students uh, over in, as I recall, in the uh, comm school, maybe it's the law school, came up with a scheme. Jefferson had a scheme for turning the interior of the rotunda at night into a planetarium and having stars shown up there. Uh, and they have been able to replicate that, of course, now with digital uh, sort of things. And so every once in a while, you can get that sort of a sensation there. 
Uh, a question from Cora follows up on that. Are there other plans to restore any missing pieces of Thomas Jefferson's original design? Well, uh, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done on the different pavilions on the lawn of getting the colors back and all of this sort of thing. And, and, and that certainly will be done. Uh, they replaced some of the roofs on the pavilions, but there still is, I mean, on the, where, where the student rooms that were, but there certainly needs to, uh, uh, certainly, certainly needs to be more done of that. Um, so, I mean, those are, I think, the things that are in, in, in progress. Um, a question from Jeff uh, says, as a student of Palladio, there must have been intense pressure on Jefferson to have symmetry. Was there any blowback or critique for having such a range of architectural styles within the composition of the lawn? Good question. I have not, uh, I've really not seen any. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a very revolutionary or very unusual a sort of a scheme that he's doing. I can imagine that there might have been some of those cranky old board of visitors when they were hearing him pulsing off of this and that. They might have said, well, really, do we need all of this? But as far as I know, there's really never been any, uh, there wasn't any real uh, concern about that. But it, once again, keep in mind, this was really an out of the way place down here. He's trying to make it a center, uh, but it was out of the way. And how many people knew what was going on down here in Charlottesville? No. Um, a question from Liz asks, why did Jefferson create an attic structure for Pavilion 10? I'm sorry, say that again. Why did Jefferson create an attic structure, the attic the, that was recently re-added? Um, uh, because 10? you can find that, you can find that in these, in these plans in the, uh, in the, in the books that he was looking at, that they had that type of an attic up there. And so that's where he's, that's where he's getting the idea. Uh, the problem was that the attic, as it was originally being used back there in Rome, uh, was enclosed and was being used for something. And here it was just simply open. And so rain would come in with leaves and so forth and create the biggest mess behind it. And the whole thing just sort of deteriorated uh, over time. But I mean, he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to show, I mean, this is a museum. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a teaching tool. Um, there is a question about, uh, was there any thought of adding sand to the paint as was done in Mount Vernon? Uh, yes, there is some sand that was used on, so, uh, on some of the, uh, uh, some of it, uh, but it wasn't used as much as it should be. And was the topography of the site a major factor in the change from the original wider design to the final yes, design of the lawn? Definitely, very, very definitely, very definitely. Yeah. Very definitely. Uh, you know, as I say, that big scheme it just couldn't fit in here. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, oh, today you could if you had Caterpillar D9s and so forth. But I mean, you think about, I mean, who's doing the work there of leveling and so forth back in those times? I mean, shovel maybe a horse or something like that, but you know, there's no way that you could do the type of leveling that would, would have been needed. Uh, there is a question here. Okay, um, thank you. Um, from Elizabeth Nomarek asks, was the blank nature of the north facade of the rotunda ever remarked upon by the citizens of Charlottesville who seemed antagonistic towards the university? Maybe she better go research that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've never seen it. Um, I, I've never seen it. I mean, there's always been a tension, as you know, between the city and the university and so forth. And, and indeed, actually, the university isn't in the city. That's in the, is in the, is in the county uh, as, as far as land goes and so forth. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I mean, if you do think of one thing, the way Brooks Hall, which I showed, the way it is placed, looking towards West Main Street, looking towards downtown, was sort of an attempt, I think, to sort of 
reorient the, 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 the campus, uh, the grounds, uh, and to make it a sort of an, an entry, a, a possibility of an entry. Uh, there's a question that says, um, from Sarah, I believe the memorial to enslaved laborers was set to be dedicated this spring, um, just in front of Brooks Hall. Curious if the yeah. work has been completed, if you have visited, and your thoughts on it as a component of the ever-evolving academical village. I think it's very, very important. I was part of the committee for it and so forth, and was involved in the uh, selection of the designer uh, and that. And yes, it is pretty much all done. I was just up there the other day uh, and took some uh, took some new pictures of it. There's still some of the landscaping out surrounding it, uh, but the basic thing itself is done uh, and is, uh, is very, very important. And uh, through the question, this was actually a question to one of the diagrams you showed. What was the fourth the furthest left chamber of Thomas Jefferson's sketch of the Capitol? Was it the executive branch with the I'm circle? Sorry, it, you remember oh, the, the diagram yeah. you had of the circle of the cabinet? You can't see what's on the left side. Do you know what that was? I don't know. I don't know. There's nothing, apparently nothing. Is, the, the drawing is in horrible shape, as you could see. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't know. I mean, there's obviously, he did do some, of an, some sort of an elevation. It just doesn't survive. And so we don't know. Uh, is there any truth to the rumor that Latrobe really designed Pavilion 9? Jefferson's taking ideas from different people and all of this sort of thing. No, I don't think uh, Latrobe really designed Pavilion number 9. The rotunda that drawing I did show, and I didn't want anyway, but if some of you looked at that drawing by Jefferson, up in the corner, there's something that's inked out. And so you turn the damn thing over and put an infrared light on it, and you can see the name Latrobe. Now it's Jefferson's drawing, but he has written Latrobe up there. And my speculation is, and other historians as well, that this drawing he was showing to the Board of Visitors and there had been a, one of the Board of Visitors had been part of the committee that fired Latrobe from being architect of the United States Capitol. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's a lot of inner workings here. And so we don't know exactly what happened, but as I've often wondered, uh, Jefferson all of a sudden realized, hey, wait a minute, I don't dare show this drawing that Latrobe had suggested to me. And so he just inks him out. A question asks, well, what do you believe are the most distinguished architectural works at UVA that are located beyond Central Downs? <laughs> <laughs> well, now we get into uh, real political problems and so forth. I mean, there is a, another whole history to the university. Uh, we kept up pretty much with the sort of the red brick, white trim Jefferson look. Uh, up into the 1940s. Uh, and then uh, in conjunction with other American campuses, probably Yale is the, is the best known, but Harvard did it, everybody did. They all of a sudden began hiring hotshot uh, modern architects to design buildings and so forth. Uh, and here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one uh, is, a, is a Campbell Hall and the Fine Arts Library, the Architecture School and the Fine Arts Library designed by uh, Pietro Belushki, who was a leading, leading modernist architect, and Sasaki, Dawson, and DeMay. And so I would say that that is, a, is, a, is an example of that. Uh, and there are others as well, but also we have uh, gone back to some degree uh, to some of the more traditional and the work of Hartman Cox uh, and Robert A.M. Stern uh, and uh, uh, Michael Graves, uh, have tried to continue on the Jefferson, uh, try to continue on the Jefferson tradition. And I think that there is some logic to some of this. Uh, the closer you are to the central grounds, uh, the more that there is a similarity. And then the farther away you get, uh, the more modern it can become and so forth. Um, there's a question that 
question from Angela says, why is the chapel stone instead of similar materials to the academic building? Why is the capital? In the DC? chapel, the chapel, the chapel at the, UVA. The chapel? Well, that's different, uh, different time. I mean, you know, 60 years have evolved uh, since then. Uh, you could transport the stone much, much, much easier and so forth than you could have uh, back in the 1810s, 18, I mean, eight, uh, 1820s. Um, and uh, also, I mean, they were attempting to create uh, very, very much a, a counterpoint to the classicism of the lawn. Uh, with the medievalism, the Gothic, uh, the Gothic, the Gothic of the chapel, and so that should be uh, so that should be in stone. And there was were the fake windows on the rotunda a common tool used during that time period? Were the the windows the fake windows? Uh, Stephen says were the fake windows on the rotunda a common tool used during that time period, windows located where the chimneys are located. Oh, yeah, that was common. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. And we have another grant that says, I understand that the university architect undertook an investigation of the use of color on the lawn resulting in the tan colored columns and understand that the triglyphs and the met metopes Met were painted yeah. Okay, were painted and that the sun was actually gold. Are, has there been any discussion of restoring that? Yes, there's been some discussion of that. Yeah, you know, no, there there is been. I mean, there was more. There was some color in some of those sorts of details, uh, but well, anyway, takes time, and then there's a, the dollar sign too. And the question of what are your thoughts on the relationship of Madison Hall? to the rotunda and to Mad Bull, so extending north. Yeah, well, I mean, once again, that was a, uh, a an attempt to uh, continue the Jefferson sort of tradition across over to, over to there. I mean, the first building, I mean, we went through our quote, Victorian period uh, of Brooks Hall. Uh, there was another building, which I didn't show you, Varsity Hall, the old Varsity Hall. Uh, and then the chapel, uh, which are very, very, very different. But then you begin to get in the 1890s, and actually prior to the fire, Fairweather Hall, today the art history, the art department, uh, that was a gymnasium, uh, that was in a sort of a Jefferson revival. And that's the first time that you sort of have a Jefferson revival uh, coming back. And so there's been this sort of this backward and back and forth on this, but it begins to come back in in the 1890s. And it's part of uh, what on a bigger scale going on in this country, the so-called colonial revival, uh, looking back to American history, can, can we continue this on instead of having all of this wild Victorian architecture? Um, a fun question is asked, One is more. there, yeah. we have two more, that's it. Okay. Is there any question you wish you could ask Thomas Jefferson about his plan for the university? If there's any, well, I ask him every night uh, several questions <laughs> and uh, I haven't gotten really quite all the responses that I, that I wanted. I mean, obviously, I mean, one of the, one of the things is, is that, uh, okay, you're doing this. Uh, what are some of the ideas I've mentioned the stuff that he saw off there in France and so forth? Are any of these ideas sort of floating through? Uh, you know, why he went to, he saw some French universities that uh, looked nothing like, uh, you know, or he was in England. He went to, he went to Oxford University. Uh, there's none of that sort of stuff. Uh, so what are some of the ideas that were knocking around in his head when he was doing this? Uh, and so forth. Um, and so that would be certainly, uh, uh, that would certainly be one of the questions. Um, I mean, we always look at him as being this Palladio freak and uh, there's quotes and so forth, but, uh, and then there's the Edouard and Chambray, but are any of the other books he really thought were really important to him would be another question. And our last question for the evening, um, asks, how has UVA's teaching of the Academical Village architectural history changed since you came here um, to teach? 
Well, there's several differences I would say that's happened. I mean, uh, one is the, um, I think there's a, a, a deeper understanding of what was intended here. Uh, the other thing is that there is certainly much more of a recognition today of who it is that built this, uh, the enslaved people uh, and the white people. I mean, that there was, a, there was a huge crew of people that was doing this work. Um, and um, that's, part of the, uh, that's part of the new story. Well, you went through all 31 questions, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody who joined us today. Uh, we were very lucky to have Richard here in our lecture series. So I know everyone's applauding you. There's been lots okay. of thank yous in the chat. So thank you again very much, everyone. And we hope to see you again. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye.